Rajesh. Uh, I am basically a retail specialist. I have been in the Indian retail sector since almost 95, so close to almost 20 years of uh, being involved with almost every startup that you have been seeing and shopping in, whether it's Spencer's or uh, Future Group or Reliance or Metro Cash and Carry. And uh, I hope to share whatever I have learned in this long journey. Hello, uh, my name is Suresh, uh, full name is Suresh Samandam. Uh, I run a company called Orangecape. Um, uh, I specialize in B2B software, that's my area. I guess I'm here because uh, we had a software platform uh, from which we pivoted into an application which is called Kissflow, which is quite successful today. We have 10,000 customers for our Kissflow product. Uh, across 108 countries who are using the software on a daily basis. So hopefully I'm, uh, I can share some of the experiences going from a platform software company to a product, a workflow software company. So I'll, I'll probably talk about that. Okay, let me introduce you the fourth member of the panel. He's a virtual panelist who refused to come uh, to the panel, but he's sitting in the front row, Chandu Nair. Uh, Chandu, um, <laughs> so he said, I was just in the previous panel, how can I be in this panel? So he said, okay, sit in the front row so that you know, we can pull you in whenever you want. Um, we'll hear lots of interesting stories from Chandu. And you know, knowing Chandu, there will also be a lot of humor going along with it. He has helped several companies, a couple of companies I know that he's helped pivot it. And they, they will be really good stories for us to hear. So um, how many of you are familiar with Business Model Canvas? Okay, good. At least a few hands, which is in a way we thought maybe a good way to start. So we have a... Okay, not that one. Um, that's not people, okay. No, it's not people, it's just an image. You can go to search the desktop and find it. Yeah, okay. So, I, I don't expect you to read everything from there. We'll, we'll just, um, you know, we'll start with a basic introduction and then we'll request Rajesh to talk through it. But essentially it has got nine components and this is what they call as a portable business plan. It's a one single picture. Um, the original one was uh, done by Alexander Alstoner and what I have here is something called the Lean Canvas which was derived from this by Ash Maurya and is very popular with uh, Lean startups. and. The word pivot itself came from Eric Ries, you know, who's, uh, who's written a book on uh, lean startups and, um, you know, a lean methodology for in startups. Um, essentially what this does is it tells you the important steps in building a business. And uh, many of these are kind of very revealing in the sense that initially when you're starting, your goal is not to find the largest segment to go after kind of thing. Your idea is to find the early adopters. Uh, we'll talk about some of those kinds of things. So the broad uh, things that we want to cover, but don't worry too much if we don't cover all of them. What is a pivot? What is a business model? We'll talk about it a little bit. What's a pivot? You know, there are lots of theories and not everybody agrees on exactly what a pivot is. So that will be something interesting to do. Why do companies pivot? Is that, you know, something that we'll talk about experiences of, uh, you know, people who are pivoted. Everybody, see, normally when you do a startup, it is an emotional thing, right? You come up with an idea, you find a problem, you want to solve it for the world, and then you start on this journey. And then suddenly you find out, okay, this is great, but there's no way I'm going to make money in this process. Or you suddenly find out that the problem you thought was the problem was not really the problem. It was just hiding another problem behind. So, you know, you start discovering all these kinds of things step by step. So, um, that, that process you go through and then finally find something that will let you go your business. Um, so, you keep on making fine tuning. I would call it course corrections, right? As pivots, okay. And then is there any particular time to pivot? Now, when, when should you let go of your original idea and slowly start moving towards others? So these are the broad things we want to cover and we will 
travel through this in different in parts. Um, so with that, um, Rajesh, can you just to describe to us what this business model canvas does? And uh, before we get into that, uh, let me start from some very basic things because it's always better to touch upon basics. My understanding of a business model is not very different from what Mr. Rakesh Junjunwala just now mentioned recently. When somebody, I am Rajesh. I am a retail specialist. I have been. No, we did introduce all of us. We introduced each one of us. Okay. Uh, so going back to Mr. Junjunwala, when somebody recently asked him why he is not invested in. You know the the current craze, which is online retail, and you know why he's not put some money into things like Flipkart. He resp- replied saying that, "Can somebody explain to me what is the business model of Flipkart?" Now everybody was shocked. Hey, come on! Aren't you asking an obvious question? Actually, no. He's asking a very basic and a very pertinent question. Now, in that context, what is he actually asking? He's asking. how are you going to make money when you are talking about making money please remember revenue is not necessarily making money any shopkeeper from morning till evening as long as he has customers coming in he has cash flow that doesn't mean he is making money so my view is a business model is a plan for how you are going to make money related to that in fact what uh, i was talking about is you have some assumptions you assume that this is the problem and this is your customer and this is how you are going to solve the problem what tends to happen is in most cases there are two huge pitfalls that uh, you know people kind of succumb to pitfall one is assuming that your idea is you know absolutely brilliant and therefore your customer is dying for that idea to the assumption and invariably ends up being a big roadblock the second assumption is the fact that all the effort and all the money that you are going to put into your business is going to be perceived to be a great thing by your customer or your investors again a big mistake like uh, this person mr kotler said once whatever you are spending on your business remains as a cost until your customer perceives value out of it so if you ask me frankly your any business model is basically these two things how you are going to make money and are your assumptions with regard to the process of making money have they been validated are they correct next step is with regard to the changing world and uh, which is what again there i was talking about the whole concept of pivot it's nothing new businesses which don't pivot which don't change you know to use a simpler and old fashioned word will obviously very soon die and the earliest example i can give you is the famous american railway system at one point of time guys who were owning the railways you know the various railway systems railway companies in the us were the absolute kings of the american economy overnight they literally died away simply because they did not do it they did not understand the fact that people are going to start preferring to drive people are going to start preferring to fly and their business is not about rail their business is actually about transportation so again linking back to the whole concept of assumption and therefore how you are going to make money and uh, in that context i think this diagram becomes a bit of a self explanatory thing so your problem solution the link to that is the key assumption that you make and that assumption is going to actually define your revenue stream your revenue stream obviously has a direct linkage to your cost because your cost is linked to your solution and usp is what customers perceive what i talked about value If the customer believes that your cost is not worth a benefit to me, it remains a cost. It will not going to generate revenues. So that's my okay. So uh, 
before uh, i actually start saying anything i thought i'll i'll say two caveats so most of the thing that we are going to say is somewhat like uh, driving a car looking into the re- rear view mirror because most of it is like history historical knowledge but future is going to be slightly different than what i'm going to say because i'm going to talk from what has happened to me in the past i don't know what's going to happen in the future so that's one caveat the second one is my experiences are only in the b2b software and especially in the enterprise either enterprise software or saas software outside of this i really don't know much so whatever i say take it in that color so that's all i am talking about these two caveats are important uh, with that i think there is generally a confusion sometimes people have a uh, difference between what is a business model and a revenue model and sometimes it's interchangeably used do you guys agree or, or um, people uh, use like revenue model in in place of business model and business model in place of, uh, of revenue model right uh, but revenue model is one of the components of a business model business model is a much larger larger thing right let me take some examples and probably tell you i also my experience is only tech so my example will also be tech so pardon me for that because tai is beyond tech uh, still i'll just stay with the tech examples because that's what i know the first one is of course uh, how we how you solve you look at a problem and how you find a solution to that problem is a, is a core part of your business model and different companies can find different solutions so so what does it mean so i'll take two examples there is something called a task management problem how do you ma- manage your to do list or a task list on a day to day basis right and there is a company called you know like 5 years ago there's a company called asana a s a n a it's pretty huge it's multiple rounds of series funding it has done and then came slack so it's again a task management problem group communication in a work environment how many of you know this company called zynga right so for those of you who don't know zynga zynga is basically a gaming software company right gaming it's a game development company but their fundamental input is that they will have games on top of facebook which which is a huge assumption in their business model so which means their audience is going to come from ba- unlike any other software game developer who will develop an independent game and figure out a distribution channel to sell their games zynga makes this fundamental business model assumption that their game is going to run on top of facebook and hence facebook becomes an input to their entire software right if facebook doesn't exist their business doesn't pretty much exist if facebook changes something it changes their entire business dynamics right so that kind of uh, for example how does it relate to us for us we are a cloud based company we have two choices we can either run on our own company i'm talking about we can either run on amazon or we can run on google and but we chose to align with google all of our technology runs on a 100% google infrastructure whether it is compute storage apis um, you know uh, cloud sql no sql <laughs> you know big query small query all the all the crap that you can think about it right so which essentially means we are so much more tied to uh the inputs to your whole business right so in this case it could be cloud infrastructure it's not so much as a problem like what zynga went through but i'm giving those examples for you can relate to uh, that aspect of the business model and then the third aspect of the business model is how you make money that's actually the revenue model how do you actually revenue so the classical example is facebook and whatsapp facebook decided to pay you pay facebook by your time not by cash that's their model right you pay by your time you spend time on facebook and that is equivalent to money for them because they monetize your time on facebook by putting advertisement for other people that's essentially how they decided to make money on the other hand whatsapp decided to take an approach that they will never put advertisements on their platform so they said it's going to be one dollar per year per user and they had 1 billion user and they just <laughs> that's all right? you you just do the math it's a simple math right so the different companies figure out different ways to make money uh, another example could be android and even ios right ios is a closed platform 
Android, on the other hand, Google took a open source as an alternative and completely sweeping the smartphone market. So each one of these is actually an input to your business model to disrupt the marketplace as well as your competitive landscape. And once you link up all these things, you get a business that is uh, like defensible, what they call the VC world, right? Defensible in the sense your competitors have trouble entering that space that you have created for yourself. It's like a shield you put yourself. It's like a good compound wall you raise around yourself, right? And that's essentially what business model is. How you combine all these aspects and create your own compound wall so that others cannot sort of penetrate into it. That's, that's what this, all, this whole thing is all about. Okay, that's where I want to stop here. Okay, so uh, let's start the uh, very beginning of a startup, right? Um, how do startups come about? What do the, you know, and then why, what is the relevance of something like a business model canvas? When I started my first company, November 1980, I had no idea. I didn't even know the word entrepreneur. At that time, it was, we were all called unemployed engineers. Actually, I was an employed engineer, decided to become unemployed uh, and start something on my own. And my only question at that point in time was, I was making 3,000 rupees in Bombay. I said, can I make those 3,000 rupees in Madras? And uh, the answer was resolving, yes. I said, okay, let me start a company, right? So, um, but we evolved after like three, four, I mean, to my fourth right now, but three of uh, companies, it's, it's, it starts, certain things start striking you, right? First thing, so I'll talk from a very common sense angle of struggling through various things. And so we first built um, solutions to people's problems. People came to us and said, build this solution, we'll pay you money. And we did that. We made some money and we became slightly successful. And we are honing our skills in building solutions. And once you start building solutions, you suddenly see it's a bunch of problems even in building solutions that nobody is addressing, then we say, okay, I'm going to go build my, I want to build these solutions, but it's taking me too much of time to do this, and the cost is a little too much. So let me go and build solutions to build solutions. That is, build some tools that will make it easy for me to build solutions. So we slowly started getting into the tools business. And then once we started using these tools, they were a little immature, so we just used to use it internally. Then we started giving out to a few people and started noticing that they're willing to pay money for the tools. So we slowly pivoted from building solutions to building tools because we said, hey, you build a tool once, a lot of people are willing to pay money for it. Well, it's not the, it was not that simple. People have to come to know about the stuff that you're doing, right? So, and we never thought about marketing because we are a bunch of techies who started, in, you know, typically of techies, like um, somebody described earlier is that, you know, here is the solution, what are the problems kind of stuff, right? So uh, that's how we approach the world. But we were building over, you know, 20 products in, in like over a three period, three companies period, I noticed one thing. One product, we, out of these 20 products, about five of them were dead, complete duds. That means they didn't even produce one cent or one pie. Okay, but they built us some skills that we could use in other products. The other, you know, like one third or one fourth of these kinds of things, got us some money. So that's what happens in startups, right? Some Something pays you some money and you feel, okay, so now I can exist for some more time. It gives you a lease of life. You go on pulling on for some more time kind of thing. So to cut the story start, there is one product that made all the difference. We just went from zero to three million dollars in one year's time. And then of course we grew the company a little bit more and we sold it. But I keep asking myself this question, what made the difference? That it is the same team, it is the same set of technologies. In fact, the technology that was required for the successful product was 10 times less than the first product we built, which is 10 times more complex. So what is the magic? What is it that really happened? And I bring those things back into this business plan. The first thing that happened was we built an early prototype. Okay, I'm telling, I can, because look at my gray hair. I'll be only telling you some old stories, right? But there is some underlying principles here. Uh, first thing that happened was we, we saw an opportunity in the marketplace. And then we went and built a small prototype to test it out. That prototype took us two person months of effort. And we were either stupid or bold. So we went and demonstrated this prototype in a conference. 
and we didn't even know that there will be any interest and we just got on the panel because we are unique in that sector and then they said okay why don't you come and demo your product we demoed it in fact while i was demoing it it crashed it didn't really matter i walked back from the demo into a booth some 50 people come and said we want that product i said that's not a product that's a prototype there's a no, no no we still want it i said but we can't give it to you we have not done with the engineering part they said no the thing is we'll be on your data to where do we sign first time you see 50 customers without you trying to sell them anything a crash demo horrible ui you know you are you are identified a demand okay so we said okay we signed that thing for 50 betas we passed the prototype to make slightly more reliable send it to them and then out of this 50 guys two guys were a little bolder instead of accepting what he said he goes what is this crap why are you guys doing this he said why are you reinventing all this work done by others and putting it in your product why don't i use all these other pieces and then just make this portion the added portion for your product and we said oh good okay let's do that that we actually cut down our work and we could get the product out to the market earlier the reason i am saying is the moment we got out to the product Microsoft came to us and said, "Hey, we want to sell this product in six countries." I said, "We don't have money to print manuals." They said, "Don't just sign this agreement saying that we can copy your one manual and we'll we'll pay you." They paid us like seventy-five dollars per product, bought fifteen hundred, and the product was not ready yet. Right? They gave it to the field force to go and sell the product. See, the thing that I'm trying to point is. the early interaction with customers is the single most important thing because if you build a product nobody wants you will never know whether there is a market for it or not we will never know if it's solving any real problems it's all in your head and we did that for a long period of time so it's not as if magically this this thing came about we we did lots of those products where we imagine the problem we produce the solution nobody really needed it or a very few small people needed it or a lot of people needed it but they are not willing to pay money for it right so that is basically what you do in this business model kind of so you point out forget about all the nine blocks start out with the first few things identify either start with a problem or start with a customer either one is fine okay uh, you start with a customer you find out what are the problems here the customers it helps if you have worked with these kinds of customers or in this industry segment before when you go and say okay we assume that these are the problems here is the solution we have in mind we we'll talk to a bunch of them don't have to have a product it can be a powerpoint demo it can be a bunch of things that locked up like a product but it's not actually doing anything behind it bunch of forms interconnected you go talk to them the more So when you go and ask them, do you have this problem? They'll say yes. So would you like a solution? They'll say yes. Would you pay money for it? They may even say yes. But that is not validation. You take something concrete in front of them. They'll say, what about this? Does it do this? Or people will say that's good. Then you know that you you know you can eliminate that person, strike them off the list. For example, most of the bootstrapping companies do this for hundreds of customers. before they get into that uh, the person there is a team like you know eric reis and steve blank uh, um, ash mauri all these people are the lean startup movement guys they say get out of the building she's get out of the building take your product go to customers talk to them get the feedback come back and then iterate keep on doing this kind of thing uh, can i just go to the next one so there is this two phases of a startup In the initial phase, you are trying to understand the problem and you are trying to define a solution that are better than the existing solutions. So, which means you need to know the solutions. And solution is not necessarily exactly a competitor that does what you want to do. Just think about this: Google did a phenomenal job in search. They came late to the game, right? There were 64 search engines before Google came, but they had couple of very interesting ways in which search work much better for anybody else now you can't beat google in search yahoo has been trying it microsoft has been trying it it's very difficult to beat google in search for a variety of reasons but google's revenue comes from advertisement facebook is beating google in mobile advertisement 
they will have search engine, right? So it is what Rajesh was talking about the transportation problem versus the rail problem kind of thing, right? If you can give, if you can give customers good referrals in very contextual advertisements. So if you move the thing from the digital revenue from search to contextual advertising, you know, Facebook is going to be good. Uh, I mean, Google is still number one in advertising, but it's, you know, it's not anymore the thing, right? It's, it, you know, it is going to change people spending more time on other things than in search media. So you, 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 you see these uh, deceptions, but let me get back to the startup story. So when you come back as a startup, you find the problem solution fit, then you need to validate it. So that's not good enough. That's not good enough for you to survive as a startup. It's not good enough for you to get funding for anything. What you really need to do is you need to quantify it. You need to say this market is this big. You need to say qualitatively say that this solution is five times better than existing solution. Right? Smartphones are 10 times more expensive than uh, feature phones. So if you needed phones only for making phone calls, there's no reason to go to smartphones. In fact, feature phones are better, the battery lasts longer and all that sort of stuff. But we switch because ten times better because your phone is not anymore a device for conversation alone. It's for browsing. I mostly spend use my phone for reading books. Uh, okay, it's for sending messages, it's a variety of kinds of things. So your solution can you know, start up with a small problem but encompass in a very different way. So going back to the business model comments, what you need to do is you need to do this iteration again and again and again. And that iteration is what is going to get you towards the kind of product that will make money for you. Okay. So these steps when you reinvent yourself are the pivots. Right? You start out, you talk sometimes you get pivot deep into a company, like you go sometimes one or two years. And then suddenly you find that, boy, how did I see this? And all of a sudden something, you discover something and say, okay, there is a better way to make more money in this kind of thing. So with that, you know, I'm going to let Suresh and Raja talk and I would like Chandra to contribute a little bit on the experiences of uh, pivots that they have seen. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so I think from business model, it, it logically uh, gets into uh, pivoting, right? So pivoting is changing your understanding of your business model you you had an understanding of your business model but you're going to change it that's actually pivoting right now the question is when did you when do you pivot or how do you know you have to pivot the question is um, they say like when your product does not find a market fit right so now how do you know your product has found the market fit so the, the term that I generally use is, uh, see if strangers are buying your product. That, that's actually, uh, <laughs> I want to say it again. See if strangers are buying your product, which essentially means your product has found a fit. So again, remember the caveat I said before, I come from a B2B space. So in the B2B space, it's easy to find if stay in the B2B SaaS space, it's easy to find if strangers are buying your product. So how? So you can create a product, put it on the cloud, and you can run a simple Google AdWord for the problem that you're solving, and you can put an ad. And people, if they are coming to your website, and they're signing up using your product, and then eventually willing to pay, that's actually strangers are buying your product. Now why this matters is sometimes young entrepreneurs, we get excited, you go meet, like I, my friend Chandu is here, I meet him in Thai and tell him, Chandu, I have this product, can you buy it? He'll say, okay, in the Swedish one, okay, 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 guess. And then we feel, we sold our product. Actually, that's not a sale. It happened to me when we first created the product, I, I know my the CEO of Numeric uh, UPS, uh, his name is Mr. Chalapan, he is a good friend of me. I went to him and said, I created this product, I need this software for your company, it will work. You give me the order and he gave me 16 lakhs purchase order just because he knew me and I started celebrating, yeah, it started working, right? That's, that's That shows my immaturity because that's how, that's not product market fit. 
unless unknown people are buying your product it's not a product market fit so if that fit happens again and again sure Uh, early revenues, okay. Uh, unknown customers buying, but I put a more stringent. Um, yeah, you are you are maybe on the right road, but I will still put a more stringent um, nomenclature for defining whether you have reached product market fit. Is the effort result ratio increasing or decreasing over a period of time? Your acquisition, for example, in in three months you acquired X customers, or X customers took Y time. Now, next period, our uh, next three months, did you acquire more or less? Are you the effort result ratio and plan with respect to time? Is it going up or is it flat or is it increasingly difficult to get newer and newer customers? Even if it's a new customer. So, that, there, is, there is this other word that I will bring from physics called resonance. Many people have any revenues, they have 95% product market fitment. But because the resonance is missing, missing which resonance can actually happen even if there is a 2%, 3% difference between what you are offering and what the market needs. If the resonance is matching, your, your scaling up doesn't happen. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's building on top of that, right? So, but the core is to find out if strangers are buying your product and, and then you can improve, improve on top of that. So if you haven't found that, then you have to go back to your business model canvas uh, and understand where is the problem. Is this the is this your revenue in terms of pricing is a problem, or is it your solution itself is incorrect? I don't know. What, multiple things could be a problem, right? Or your channel could be a problem because if your uh, if your product is about uh, selling to large enterprises and you just have an online and you put a credit card and then they you're expecting them to come and buy, that's not going to work. So large enterprises expect you to be in their offices and talk to them and they, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of different problems can happen. So, so that's essentially what I would say. So go back, why would you, when would you pivot? You pivot when you don't find product market fit. When do you know you have a product market fit? If strangers are buying. If strangers are buying, you pretty much have it. How much they are buying, how much such strangers exist in the market will determine your size of the market, how much such strangers exist out there will determine the size of your market and how do you find it? The most simplest tool, again, everything I'm telling is B2B, okay? <laughs> the most simplest thing that you can do in the B2B space is go to Google AdWords and put all the keywords that describe your product and then see search volume. There is something called search volume. Just put all the keywords and then search volume that will tell you how many people are searching for the thing that you are, uh, what, that your product is solving. And that's a good indication and you, you have to multiply it with some factor, okay? So it's just a guideline, but that's a good guideline. So that's what we do, that's what we did. So then you use that to figure out that's a big enough market. So if it's a big enough market, then you decide to go and raise venture funding. If it is not a big enough market, you still build the business because you don't need to, you, need, you don't need venture market money all the time. It's a wrong, uh, you, you can always build a 5 million, 10 million, 20 million dollar business for yourself without VC money, right? But if you can, if you want to build a billion dollar business and then it requires a VC money, then you go after the VC money, right? So let me come back. So that's what it is. And even before you build a product, uh, if it's a B2B, uh, people tend to um, do some sort of a mock website. That's one other technique that you can find. Even before you build a product, let's say your product solves something, right? You build a one-page website and it probably takes two days to do it, which describes the value that you are giving the company and describes the price and everything, right? And then you put a Google AdWords. There is no product, you, okay, there is only website, okay? You have not written a single line of code. There's only one page, there is price, there is value proposition and everything, right? And then you put an ad and then see if people are coming and signing up. If people are coming and signing up, it proves something. And then you start building the product. And the, the first step is to validate the need and the demand. The second step is whether your solution is right or not is a different problem. Then you have to build a prototype, put the solution in there. If the solution is right, then they will, they will really buy, right? So you go through this process and then if you find the product market fit, you continue to push the pedal forward. 
But if you have not found the product market fit, go back to the drawing board and then you pivot. Pivot means change. Or sometimes you can completely drop the idea itself because I was advising a company which does carpooling and uh, we were trying to do it for six to nine months and then we figured out that the mindset for people to pull into carpooling and then make a business out of it is, is probably not there yet. Um, and coins, so we, we dropped that idea, uh, the company dropped that idea a year ago. Now, another set of entrepreneurs have come back and somehow they found I advised the company on carpooling, they came back to me when I'm again advising another carpooling company. This time they, they solved the same problem, but I think we found a unique proposition which will probably which will probably help the carpooling to take off. So, so you sometimes people find different solutions to the same problem. So that's what the whole pivoting is all about. So you, if you found a product market fit, then great. Otherwise, go back to pivot. I again would like to go back to you know basic taking off on what uh, Suresh said and uh, what Suresh was talking about. Hey, get out of the building. We work in a startup or we work in a corporate. Is that we have this idea in a nice air-conditioned room and we think that we are the next uh, Einstein and Newton. The fact remains that nobody is going to pay you money for the idea. So you need to go outside and ask people whether the idea makes sense and whether they are ready to pay money for it. And I'll give you two, three examples. Let me start from a you know, very common thing that all of you might uh, identify with in a B2C space. When we started off Food World Supermarket way back in uh, mid-90s, <clears throat> we had this fancy lighting and air conditioning and we had staff who would say good morning, good afternoon and all that and we found that the customers are actually feeling a bit afraid. When we did this, you know, we, we kind of tried, tried to reach out to customers uh, and in one focus group, one lady after a lot of prodding actually stood up and said that, sir, you know why we feel uncomfortable coming to your store? Because we can't come there wearing our nighties. It might sound a ridiculous thing, but the fact is, when we started probing behind it, we realized that for them, that statement indicates a huge sense of comfort. And the fact that if they said, I need to dress up to come to your store, there is a sense of intimidation. So that was a huge learning. And we had to actually start telling our staff after insisting that they say, good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> to you know, tell them to say Vanakum Madam, Madakum Sir, Vanga, things like that in the local vernacular. Linked to that was another interesting learning, which is we used to sell rice, we would say clean, you know, very good quality, etc. etc. Uh, so we charge you two rupees more. Customer said, Why should I pay you two rupees more? So again we went back spent a lot of time and we figured out one very interesting correlation. We found that a customer is ready to pay 2 rupees more if you give them cleaned rava. But they will not pay you 2 rupees more if you give them cleaned rice. Any guesses from the audience? Why? Rice is washed. Exactly. Anyways, I am going to spend time and effort washing the rice whether you clean it or not. It's like the milk that we boil every day morning. We get milk which is actually pasteurized, we don't need to boil it. But yet we will waste electricity and gas every day boiling milk. Countries like Europe and uh, UK and all those things. You have a lot of these small you know, eateries and bistros who will sell sandwiches and pastries and croissant and all those things. And the bulk of metros sale and also profits because high margin items comes from these baked items like you know bread, croissant, bagels and things like that which they will semi cook in their bakery and at 4.35 in the morning there will be this long line of guys from the eateries who will come pick it up, take it to their respective you know uh, eatery, keep it in their uh, uh, storage and as and when you come in I'll just pop it into the microwave and sell it to you. Then Metro tried to come with the same mindset into the Indian context, which is the biggest, largest eatery group in our country. All your, you know, Kayendi Bhavans and Kamats and, you know, Murugan Idli Kadai types. 
obviously they are not going to be buying you know bakery uh, bagels and uh, bread so initially we got very excited and we said okay what's the equivalent he said idli so let's sell idli batter and then we figured out that the cost and effort for us to get idli batter in place store it and for somebody to come all the way and buy idli batter and go and make idli or dosa is not worth it so the great idea turned out to be a big flop and lastly i'll give you something that all of you already would possibly know or uh, might not be aware or might be aware which is the whole evolution of your mp3 players and which is to some extent morphed into the mobile phone the smartphones that he was talking about uh, if somebody had gone to singapore or uh, any of those uh, countries in that belt the asia pacific belt i'm talking about uh, mid 90s you would find a very peculiar behavioral pattern there are large number of commuters because unlike in our country we don't believe in they don't believe in you know driving one person driving a car all over the place because it's very expensive plus they their public transport is very very good so you had people using the metro the bus system etc and almost everybody would have a cd player that uh, you know compact disc that sony became very popular for and they have this pouch which had this 20 30 50 100 series prima facie there's no major business idea built into it but obviously somebody spend time understanding consumers and they realize that when the customer has started moving from expecting say 20 or 30 songs in a tape to around 70 songs in a cd and they are no longer happy with one cd they want two cds and then it's going up to 10 cds which means they want to carry a choice of 700 songs very soon even the 700 songs is not going to be enough and i have a feeling somewhere this whole ipod the design the interface and all that might be the talking point but the core business idea that you can carry an almost unlimited supply of music again moving forward the fact that i don't want to have five different devices with me how can i integrate it and this whole apple watch now i think is just the next step in that journey now the challenge and this is something i throw open for discussion is whether apple has actually been able to understand customers and your apple watch actually caters to the customer needs or is it just uh, you know a win of apple to say okay now we are again in, on big time technology sure but that's that's exactly what i was talking about see uh, you can create a new way of fulfilling a demand the demand can be latent it can be obvious so that's why i gave you this whole example of uh, people who used to carry tons of cds and the ipod did not actually create a new demand essentially it gave you a better solution for an existing demand I think right now it's not much of a value. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I've been wearing it for like a month now. Um, it doesn't sound like much of a value because it doesn't have a killer app yet. Um, I bought it for my fitness regime, but right now this doesn't is not good for swimming. So I can't jump into the pool with this. This will go bad. So maybe it will evolve. Maybe the phase two will evolve. But I think it, this will take off. Uh, right now it is very very early so only innovators and people who are enthusiasts this is buying but i think the mainstream will probably take off or i what i think you should go to audience yeah, yeah. Uh, but before that actually uh, can we jump in and you know talk a little bit about yeah from the yeah from the point of view of Okay, one quick learning going be beyond what all these gentlemen said is uh, because I've also done pivots in my own company is sometimes you have to kill what you have in order to become something else that you are not. 
so that's a very tough thing to do because emotionally you get so wedded to what you have and to do it twice actually to kill your own company with a current model it takes a lot of doing because you are literally burning bridges with current customers with current offerings even current employees it's a very painful decision but uh, something that is inevitable uh, you are not like a snake removing uh, the skin so the way i look at it is there are three possibilities therefore for entrepreneurs over a period of time one is to change the way you play the game example deal scoop you know mr uh, dushan created this stroke very peculiar stroke which is not been perfected by other guys the second is to change the way the game is being played like the europeans change the way hockey is played and made asian countries kind of become also rams in hockey and you also see formats of the game like in cricket t20 odi test each of which require different ways of playing the game or the third which is the more dramatic is change the game itself you say i am not good in cricket we play kabaddi make it on olympic sport i'll get one medal so i think all three options are there for entrepreneurs you know it is change the way you play the game change the way the game is played or change the game itself and i think these are ways by which i would say the business model evolves incrementally substantially or fundamentally so i would say that uh, those are learnings that i've got and the other thing which we always repeat as entrepreneurs is fail fast fail often fail cheap and keep repeating okay so i would say that please go ahead and fail very good today it is okay to fail nobody worries to so much about you know people today for example in in uh, in iit uh, some of the iits they are allowing you to start off an enterprise and within the next two years you can come back to campus for placement it's a fundamental shift in thinking of uh, educational institutions that they are allowing you to experiment so when the culture is changing today in india i would encourage all of us even if you are you know you think you have grey hair okay but if you still have a very nice hardcore idea go for it chennai angels has funded entrepreneurs who are 60 plus also you know pro clean chemicals is funded by been founded by one such entrepreneur colonel sanders kfc started his first enterprise at 65 so i would say age is just a number so don't get worried when i was in in the 1998 uh, 99 dot com boom we didn't get funded by many guys because they said you are too old at that time so uh, the quick thing i'm trying to say is that uh, here uh, the opportunities today that exist for experimentation for frequent trial for failing and for trying again a much better than it was even i would say 7 or 8 years ago actually uh, i think i don't know whether we uh, everybody caught one thing which nand uh, chandu said uh, when you pivot you actually have a different business that's why burning the bridges with customers with employees everything happens when you pivot you're no longer the company that you had before and the company after the pivot is sort of the same it is very different I, i'll give you my example So before we pivoted into this Kissflow product, we had an enterprise product which we helped uh, customers to build the cloud-based applications. We used to sell that product for like close to hundred thousand dollar minimum entry price. But on the other hand, Kissflow is three dollars per user per month, meaning the hundred thousand dollar product, the way you sell it, the way you service it, the way we you uh, SLAs, everything is very different. And the three dollar product, the way you sell it. it's completely different the 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 way you uh, the sales model the discounting uh, the proposals the contracts the guy who sells it everything is different so essentially you morph completely into a different company uh, so that's something pivoting means you have a new company now <laughs> which is no longer correlates to whatever some some overlap will be there but it pretty much is a new company yeah we we pretty much have to so uh, like you said uh, we when renewals come up after like we have three year renewals the third year we just don't renew the renewal because if you renew it you have obligation you get the money then you have the obligation to support right so you have to go back and say no we are not renewing this anymore the so customers will get furious and all that stuff will happen
I would also say one extra point. Indians have historically been Thali meal people. We want everything on the Thali. Okay. But I think it's time to move to a little more focused niche. You know, Dora is fond of saying that Americans and the Indians are horizontal eyes. They are inch deep and mile wide. Time has come for us to be at least a double T, which is your, you know, little more, maybe a foot wide, but a mile deep. So just think about it a little more. I would say that that may make more sense in today's context. So uh, my question is, if, uh, you, you told pivoting is a good point, right? For example, if I have a uh, startup and I have a business model where I got funding from VC or angels. So uh, I have a steady flow of uh, incoming cash. But I, I see an opportunity in business wherein I can have more revenue, right? In that case, if at all I want to pivot, right, my VCs or my uh, angels would be scared of uh, me suddenly pivoting to something other than going to my uh, initial uh, point wherein I got my investment in. So in that case, right, which is the best point for me to uh, start up another fresh uh, initiative parallelly or uh, pivot uh, based on my intuitiveness? We got it. Uh, I, d I think a VCs come once your product found, finds the product market fit. That's, that's the thing that they are basically looking at. Angels come in the early days. Uh, most of the pivoting will happen around the angel or even pre-angel round. Even angels actually look for whether this is actually sort of early market fit is seen or not. Sometimes it's very hard to decide. So they, they have to go with the gut and bet on the team that this team will figure out the way to do it, right? But but once you cross the angel stage, rarely you can pivot. But it, it's, I'm not saying it's never happened. But by the time a VC invests like a series A round in your company, your company has found a product market fit. Yeah, this thing called the uh, Flipkart, right? They, they went into digital market suddenly, right? They wanted to sell uh, software or music online. Uh, instead of uh, selling uh, selling a C to and then they went back again and uh, those kind of luxuries uh, do uh, very not very advanced no. uh, that's no. like diversification yeah. they decided to shut down one line in their e-commerce but their whole e-commerce as a business right they never pivoted out of that I'm just telling that for an example a lot of companies are there which had actually pivoted and uh, gone up well or sometimes if they pivot right uh, their uh, stakeholders held back and uh, stopped uh, their let, funding. Let me go to again. Let me go to an absolute basic point. <clears throat> Why does anybody start a business apart from the passion of the idea to make money? Right. Otherwise, we would all be doing social service with NGOs. Why does an angel come into the picture or a VC come into the picture to make money? Not because they love you. Right. So the question is. If you are able to convince and if you are able to, uh, first of all, you are convinced and you are you are validated that your business can perform better if you pivot, why shouldn't a VC or an angel stop you? I mean, why shouldn't they support you? Why should they stop you? Because this is a steady income with the current flow. You have to understand, a VC is not looking at it from an income point of view. The VC is always spend, you know, investing in you, already keeping in mind the exit strategy. Yeah, see, work, there are a couple of things, right? When you look at the business model, there are several components. So for a long time, I was thinking pivoting means coming up with a different product. But that's not necessarily true. It could be a slightly different your business model, different way of making money. Let us take some well-known examples. Google's initial business model was to sell license the search engine for a million dollars. They went to Yahoo and I think try to sell it for a million dollars kind of thing. Somewhere along the line, when they are trying to do it and there are not enough buyers, they, it's no, it, their new business model was nothing new. It was already existed. Yeah, Overture had it. So they said, okay, in fact, they are going to go to Overture to do this, then they decide to do it themselves. So what happens is that you do discover, I think perseverance and, uh, you know, is basically not letting go and staying in business. But adapting to the, take Microsoft for example, there was a period when they were unshakable. In the mobile market, where are they? Okay. 
why didn't they get in early into certain markets why didn't they get in early into the web document market which google is ruling to some extent is because the office group would not allow that to happen i i i know that you know they had a ipad version of office 3 years ago right but the, that ceo didn't allow it to happen because they said we will not sell more windows because of this but what happened now and they now they have it and they are enjoying uh, the rewards so what is happening is it's a very emotional decision and i think you can take different things and maybe you can continue the existing business you switch over when the new one becomes and then you become a different very different kind of company in that sense in uh, yeah so but you know they sold their back office business to somebody else and i mean there are all these cases so i don't think first of all we are not saying that everybody should be wet and i agree with rajesh is that you don't have a choice you are not able to find that thing that the rhythm of your business and this is actually moving towards the rhythm of your business is that you want to spend the least amount of effort maximize your you know profits and then you know enjoy doing work and then keep serving your customers in new ways and that requires you to change yeah it has to be brought in there there could be many factors and uh, you need to take a call and you need to ideal the ideal way is to have an external crisis for an average indian you know the external crisis is the best way that's reacting to a situation correct so the other way if you are a smart entrepreneur is to manufacture the crisis that's what we did okay. we, you know to make our employees buy in you create a crisis that look the current thing you are the company is really going down the tube i would say we react best we work well only when there is a big crisis situation yeah that, okay so true. create a bloody crisis so there is no cash i can't pay you sell this 3 months will you work you will know how many guys will stick with you okay create a crisis you will be surprised how our indian suddenly become you know we can shrink our belt tighten our belt shrink our waist everything and become somali refugees and live in kanji for 2 3 months but show them dream of nice five star buffet so uh, one reason why we uh, can pivot is uh, could be a uh, internal competition within the product offerings like uh, uh, there are many sunset examples like of uh, microsoft uh, they had to sunset uh, windows xp because it was competing with uh, windows 7 people were not migrating to windows 7 and windows uh, vista so they had to eventually sunset it uh, stop the support even when uh, people are uh, still using it uh, since past several years uh, after uh, it was sunset so like that there are many uh, incidents like maruti i have to sunset uh, some uh, products like uh, esteem and uh, baleno to bring out uh, new uh, products uh, so that they don't compete with each other so like uh, there are many no, no, products I, which i want to agree that is only product life cycle management that's a product management strategy that's not a fundamental pivot of any sort Reporting examples which are related to product market 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 viable sustainable and makes money you know yeah uh how are we doing on time very tight uh just take one more one more question because there are a lot of hungry people here oh uh, yeah go ahead so we'll take two questions because you've been raising your hand for long time so let me take her first and then yeah go ahead yeah uh so you have a product a startup you know comes up with a product and you know that there are many other big players you after and it's an innovating product you know it's an innovative product but you know as soon as it comes into the market there are some big players you can you know they have that wide reach they can easily come up with similar but 
you know have that same kind of innovative capability so as a startup you know how to overcome that fear of you know launching that okay let me take i'll give you one answer to this we were we were actually at one point in time uh, we were looking at some products and then the first question you ask at surface how long will it take for microsoft or google to do it you know and it will be like a fraction they already have 10 times more technology than you have but there is something very interesting about big companies big companies move slower second thing is that at the time we were talking about it unless the business is worth about 200 million dollars microsoft will not be interested okay and now i think it is a billion dollars so anything under so vcs won't even fund you if it encroaches in the space but if you are like you know in the small space it's now it doesn't even come under the radar they are not even looking at these kinds of things for this so that is one one area of defense but the second thing is this you can come from a very entirely different the example suresh was giving about um slack for example you can come from an entirely different angle whatsapp you know we so based on a bunch of things like technology and all kinds of things and it's not difficult for others to do it uh, but it doesn't really matter because you get in early and get a whole bunch of customers you get a network going and you are already sailing right not necessarily not all the time <laughs> actually on on mundane things then people have innovated unfortunately i have to give another popular example email clients are the most nobody thought you can reinvent email until gmail came so that's a classical example of the same problem different solution wiping out a market from hotmail meaning hotmail is non existent today right <laughs> pretty much gmail overtook that so same problem different solution and startups can do that that's that's essentially what startups can do chennai you have examples like idli factory trying to reinvent how idli is eat and consumed distributed you know so you have fellows like uh, amadora speciality ice cream selling at 200 rupees a scoop so you have guys trying to do different different things and i'm sure that there there will be opportunities for individual entrepreneurs to make a big difference one the last question yeah you the gentleman uh, i think a uh, uh, lot of talks on going on pivoting so being a startup uh, we had a quantified uh, idea we went to the customer we built a solution uh, for institutions to understand uh, where the jobs are uh, by looking at all the job portals we wrote our own engine and when it when it comes to getting the money from the institution it's always a big problem you know we uh, we ended up uh, failing on that uh, although we were successfully able to increase a placement record for a couple of universities in chennai then we thought okay then there are a lot of inv- uh, i went back and uh, hashed back my business model whether am i in the right in the right track or not uh, to one of the startup advisors and he forwarded my business plan to indian age network and they started look asking about my business plan then i okay where do i make revenue if i'm not going to make revenue from institutions so i started so then my entire business model is built on a particular revenue model didn't work then uh, i started thinking about what are the other ways to do it because as part of this pl- entire uh, assessment we built a lot of assessment engine and a lot of assessment questions and we saw that nsdc has a huge requirement for that and so as other people okay so uh, we found that there are uh, the way Uh, we ended up pivoting based upon uh, the new revenue streams which you have to look at because there is an investor who was ready to invest and he is asking me come back with different revenue streams for me so i think pivoting is need not be that uh, you have a problem. after doing all kinds of research validation and all because the indian scenario selling to a b2c is always difficult you know so i find that uh, this business uh, we getting selected by couple of angel investors to looking at uh, positively on our uh, on the on the system we have built we ended up we being pivoting but how often do we pivot is is the question i have for a startup do we do it like once in three months once in two months yeah, I, I <laughs> so think we that is something asked. nobody asked i thought like maybe no, that I, could I be a question we already answer. addressed that uh, when this topic of perseverance versus pivoting came in mm-hmm. uh, pivoting is not something that you do once in a quarter or once in three oh, months yeah. you know it is not big. like your annual appraisal mm-hmm. you pivot when your customer needs change which is why you have to go back and keep validating your customers uh, in fact it was interesting that you by starting off about your uh, 
business model i actually wanted to ask you who is your real customer is it the education institution is it the students or is it the companies okay that's a good question because mm. you know unless you figure out who is your real customer getting payment would always be difficult because you don't know whom to ask okay see uh, in, in india uh, basically if you uh, there are Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do that. But there is a difference, you know. In all these, look at these lean canvas and others. They make clear difference between customers and users. And you know, I think that is yeah. And PDR is there is nothing, you know. Like do you pivot only if whatever you tried here doesn't work, doesn't generate enough revenue for you to go forward. Uh, and you have to look at alternatives. All uh, or the market is changing and the customer needs are changing. Yeah. You don't want to pay me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.